Hey guys, it's Landon Blake from Redefined Horizons, and in this video I'm doing chapter four, covering chapter four of the book on land tenure. So we're we're moving along through that book, which is good. Chapter four, lots of good information, pretty simple, it wasn't too complicated, so this should be a short video. Uh, it's like a couple of the other chapters in the book. There's a lot of, of information that's specific to particular regions or states, and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna cover that in detail. Um, I encourage you get your copy of the book and read the information on the region or the state you're in. So, for example, I'm in California. I need to understand what happened in the southwestern United States in my particular state. So uh, read that part of the of chapter four for your state. Uh, if you're a land surveyor, I encourage you to do that. So what I want to do in, in, the, in the video is just kind of cover the basic concepts in chapter four that are applicable all over the place. And so essentially what chapter four does is it takes... It, it tries to explain to us how we get from the big, huge land grants that were made early in our nation's history, the United States history, how we get from there to the parcels of today, which are obviously much smaller. And I think Chapter 4 does a good job of that. So they start kind of on the East Coast and move their way West, which is, which is what I'm going to try and do. So at first they talk a little bit about the subdivision of the colonial grants. So the grants to the 13 colonies, and they kind of break those into two groups. So you have the colonies that were in North, in, uh, north uh, sorry, New England, kind of the Northeast, and then you have the, the colonies in the Southeast, those that were outside of New England, and there was kind of two systems that developed. So in New England, most of the original colonial grants that came from the, the king or queen were surveyed into regular lots, so squares or rectangles, before they were settled. So they were surveyed first, then they were settled and the subdivisions were fairly regular. There weren't a lot of gaps and overlaps in between the lots of those original surveys. And so that's kind of how things went in New England. In the Southeast, uh, the, the land kind of got settled first and then it got surveyed after. So people would go out and claim land and then it would come in and be surveyed. And as a result of that, the lots were frequently irregularly shaped and you would sometimes get gaps of less valuable land in between parcels of more valuable land that were settled first. And so the southeast was kind of a little more haphazard. Uh, I am not from the east coast, so if you're from that area and uh, you disagree with the book, I would love to hear about that in the comments. But that's basically kind of the two ways those original colonial grants were subdivided. And so then outside of those original 13 colonies, you basically, most of the land ended up in the hands of the federal government. And there's a couple reasons why. One, as colonies became states in the in the new United States, they uh, were, I don't know if you want to say asked or forced, they were, uh, let's say asked, they were asked to hand over their unsettled lands to the federal government. Part of the reason the federal government wanted to do that is they had to pay revolutionary war debt. They had no income tax, federal income tax at that time, no federal power to tax. So the United States wanted to get that land so it could sell it to settlers and pay off its revolutionary war debt. So as those original colonies became states, they gave up their unsettled lands. And then the other land that came, for example, with the Louisiana Purchase or the uh, Treaty of Guadalupe, that was those lands became the property of the federal government uh, as those purchases or treaties, purchases were made or treaties were signed. So there was some debate apparently among the founders uh, you know, among the early early governments of the United States and the, the governments of the original 13 colonies, I didn't know this is something I learned from Chapter 4. There was some debate about how to dis properly dispose of this new land that the federal government had, and there was kind of two conflicting views. So some of the colonies in the southeast wanted to sell large tracts of land. They wanted to have the land given first to big private land development companies who would then carve it up and sell it to individual uh, property owners. So that was kind of the plantation model that the, that the southeast the southeast colonies were used to. Those in New England kind of wanted to see a system that was more like their system. They wanted the, the land to be surveyed first and then to small plots to be sold to individual owners rather than to large private land holding companies. And that kind of more closely reflected their model. So who won? Uh, well, you you would think that the, the, <laughs> that the New England colonies won those on the Northeast, uh, because we ended up with the public land survey system, which is a system that surveys first, then sells and settles, and surveys regular lots that are sold, uh, fairly small lots that can be sold to individual settlers. So you would think they won, 
and I guess it, in the long run they did win. But before they won, uh, the the guys in the southeast uh, actually were able to convince the federal government to uh, to give some uh, some land grants to some large private companies. So that was done at least twice. Chapter four mentions two large land grants to private companies. Uh, both tried to have systems where they surveyed the land privately and then disposed of it, and both had major problems. So um, there were major problems with the surveys. There were uh, the land didn't get disposed of quickly enough. There were just there were issues, and so kind of after those two uh, infamous kind of high-profile failures, the the guys in the southeast basically gave up, and we moved to the public land survey system that we now know. So that system was established in 1774. There was an ordinance there that was passed by Congress. They kind of outlined the rough elements of the system. They did the seven ranges in Ohio. I'm not from Ohio. I'm not an expert on that, but they tried some different things in Ohio. Kind of got the kinks worked out of the system, kind of. <laughs> in uh, 1796, they came in and passed a new act, and they kind of tried to fix some of the problems with the original survey. So, you know, section corners and quarter corners were being set, and they required that the surveyor prepare field notes and that a plat be drawn. And so the, the, that was essentially the system, that division into regular one-mile square lots or, or quarter-mile quarter, quarter mile lots, survey first, then disposal. That was kind of the model that we that we got after the two big failures there with the, with the private surveys. So that's kind of how the United States get gets carved up. That's how we go from big grants or purchases to the smaller parcels that we that we have today. That was a big step. That was kind of the middle step. The, the next step that kind of takes us from those regular lots, especially sectionalized land in the western United States or the smaller parcels in the colonial states, how we get from those to the to parcels we have today is the process of subdivision. That's what they talk about in the second part of chapter, chapter four. And they basically talk about two types of subdivisions formal and informal, so let me explain the difference. So an informal subdivision, there was generally a, a plat or subdivision map that was drafted, but it was not filed or recorded. The only evidence of the plat was typically in the in the old deeds. The deeds might refer to that plat, uh, but it was kind of, yeah, it was a little bit sketchy. Um, at some point, we moved to a system of more formal subdivisions, which is what we have now, certainly in California, where there's an official subdivision map that actually gets recorded. Uh, everybody can get a copy of the map. And there's regulations now, subdivisions, so they regulate what surveyors have to put on the map. They also regulate things like lot size and how much public right-of-way you have to dedicate for roads and how much parks you have to have. and All that kind of stuff gets regulated now. So we, we've moved to a much more formal system. Uh, in hindsight, I'm generally not a huge fan of regulation, but I think we've got a lot better about how we subdiv uh, subdivide land. And I certainly think the formal subdivision process, if, if it's well implemented with a fairly light touch is definitely superior to, to dividing land the old way, which is by deed and, and formal subdivision. So the book kind of closes by helping again, helping trying to help surveyors see the connection between the past and the present. And basically what it says is you can't go survey a parcel today without some understanding about, about how it came into existence. So you need to understand the original survey that created the parcel. That's the, the root of the title usually is that some, at some point there was a survey done that serves as the root of the title. So if you're in the Western United States, that, even if it's just the original public land survey, there was a survey at some point that formed the basis of the land title for your current parcel. And the type of cadastral system, the type of survey that was done and the type of cadastral system that was in place, we talked about a couple of the different kinds, you know, the, the Southeast versus the Northeast. Understanding all that helps you understand the title of your parcel today and, and it helps you get it surveyed. So you need to be aware of the past. And I'll just, I'm gonna read you a quote from the book. It says, an understanding of the evolution of any particular state is paramount in order to fully comprehend many of the aspects of a tract of land. This is true even when title is established under one system but is now within a different system. So again, they're saying the past is important even if you're under a new system now, a different system. So for example, in California, you gotta understand something about the Mexican land grants and how Mexican uh, property law works. Because even though we're in California now, uh, we still have the old Mexican land grants. And, and you know, most of Stockton, for example, my hometown is in a Mexican land grant. So you got to know something about how the, how the Mexican land grants worked and how they were surveyed. And they want you to understand that 
the survey systems that were used to take those huge land grants in the beginning and, and make the smaller parcels that we see today, you know, that was a, even though that was intangible, those systems were intangible, they made a very real physical imprint on the land. And you can see that if you're in the Western United States, you can see the one mile by one mile grid of the sections. You know, if you're in the Eastern United States, you can see the boundaries of the land grants. Uh, if you're in my part of California, you can actually, in some places, you can see the boundary of the Spanish land grants. You know, you'll see the public sectionalized land grid run up against these irregular shaped Spanish land grants. You can see that. And so those intangible systems from hundreds of years ago, a couple hundred years ago, have had a very real impact on the shape of the land that we inhabit today. And that's kind of one of the key concepts that the book closes with in Chapter 4. So there you go. Land Tenure Chapter 4 tells us how we got from the really big land grants to the smaller modern parcels that we have today. Again, helping surveyors appreciate land title is important and history is important. History is the basis of all land title, and you need to understand that if you're going to make a survey.